And so the kids are eating grass and they're ba 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 and buying and um and the teachers all have staffs and they're herding the sheep. So it's just a wonderful day. And they're learning that God wants to be their loving shepherd and care for them just as David cared for his sheep. So it's a great lesson they have. Well, this morning I have entitled our lesson, What's in a Name? What's in a Name, right? Names are really important. I know expectant parents spend months agonizing and arguing and researching about what they will name their babies, right? And eventually they come up with whatever, I don't know, sounds good all together, or maybe it's a family name, or some people like to just make sure that it's a unique name and no one else will ever have that name. Well, as many of you know, we're kind of working through that naming process as our daughter is expecting her first child, our first grandchild. And so they found out a couple of weeks ago, the doctor confirmed it is a boy. And so they have picked out a name and um, I'm not spilling any secrets. My grandson's name will be Samuel Wesley Dawson. In that, I know, I'm so excited. First week of February. But it's a great name. And so as soon as she told me that his name would be Samuel, I, being a Bible study teacher, immediately said, oh, that's so sweet. You've, you're naming him after the Old Testament prophet and servant of God, Samuel. And she said, you can think that if you want, Mom. <laughs> she said, but actually, and she started to tell me the story, she being a uh, native Texan, her husband being a very proud Tennessean, she said, we found the common link that connects those two states, and that would be the man that was the governor of both of those states, Sam Houston. Yes, and so they are using a little southern history to name their child. I am going to stick with biblical history that they're <laughs> naming him. But no matter the origin of his name, I just love it. Samuel Wesley Dawson is, a, to me, a powerful name. But as powerful as I feel my grandson's name is, he will at some point in his life have to bow his knee to a truly the powerful name of the universe. He will have to call upon another name, a name that is matchless, a name that will secure his eternal destiny. You and I, as we studied this week, we read through the scriptures about the power that is in the name of Jesus. He has the power to heal physically. Yes, that's what we looked at this week, but also the power to heal us emotionally and spiritually. This means that when we surrender our lives to the name of Jesus and call on his power, that power indwells us and gives us the ability to overcome shame and guilt and fear and discouragement. That power allows us to heal broken relationships. That power breaks the bond of sin that it has on our lives. And it is only through the power of the name of Jesus that that sin can be broken in our lives. So as we go through the scriptures this morning, I would just challenge you. Have you called on the power of Jesus' name? Have you experienced the freedom that comes in living in his name? Have you allowed him to break the chains of sin and suffering that keep you in bondage? He wants to make you whole. He wants to heal you. Will you this morning call on the powerful name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these very clear scriptures today that lay out the gospel. Father, I pray that you will get me out of your way so that your truth will be heard and it will be understood and it will be applied to the lives of everyone in this room. Father, we thank you for this time. It is in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, let me just set the stage where we are in Scripture as we open chapter 3. We're still in the city of Jerusalem, okay? And in the city of Jerusalem, the crowd is made up of all Jews, right? 
Peter's Jewish by birth. John is Jewish by birth. The lame man is Jewish. The crowd, everybody in the crowd at the temple that day is Jewish, right? This is a Jewish city, okay? So we have to think of it in that terms as, as we go through this lesson. But there's a difference. Peter and John, who were born Jewish, have believed in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, and he has transformed their lives. And so now they are going to allow the spirit that has indwelled them to come as they urge their fellow brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith, that they urge them to yield to the powerful name of Jesus. So remember, Peter had, last week we looked at his first sermon, and that sermon was the first sermon that he preached to the church, right? And it was powerful. I mean, it did a powerful work for the Lord's um, kingdom, 3,000 people came to know the Lord at that first sermon, right? But Peter knows that he's still got work to do. And so he's continuing to do work. We don't know when the events of chapter 3 took place, how long after. But I would reckon, you know, a few days, a week, maybe after that first sermon. And so Peter and John, we're told, are going to the temple to pray. Now, let's just stop right here and think about this. Peter and John, if you were with us last week when we studied Matthew... Um, Peter and John weren't, they're all in ministry together, but they're not really buddy-buddy. We always read about Peter and Andrew together and James and John together, right? And their the personalities are totally different. Remember, Peter is very boisterous, and he's going to talk to anybody and just burst out, and he never met a stranger, right? John's a little more reserved, a little more contemplative, a little more thoughtful, right? So different personalities. And last year, remember, we saw them. They are jockeying for position all the time. Hey, who's going to sit at your right hand? Well, now that the Holy Spirit has indwelled them, they are no longer jockeying for greatness. They are working in unity together for the growth of the church. So it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they're going to the temple to pray. There were three prayer times um, at 9 in the morning, noon, and at 3 in the afternoon. And Peter and John, they've done this their whole lives. They've gone to pray three times a day. And so that's what they're doing. They're doing what comes naturally. They're, they're going to the temple to pray. Now, before we get into the scriptures, one more thing we need to understand. The temple was not like our churches that we have today because you go to your church on Sunday and it is crowded it is bustling it is busy it is active right but you go to your church on Tuesday afternoon and you could probably shoot a cannon down the hallway and not hit anyone right that's just the way it happens here in in 2018 but in the temple back in Jesus's day the temple was busy all the time it was the center of activity. There was always something going on, conversations, teaching, commerce. Okay, so there is always busy. There are always people at the temple. So we have a picture of the temple. I think Lauren's going to pull it up for us. So they go to the temple, and they enter through, through the beautiful gate. Now, I got this picture. I went to the Apostle Peter's uh, Facebook page, and I got this picture. Um, no, this is a scaled model from some museum in Jerusalem. Um, but you see the beautiful gate where the arrow's pointing. There were nine gates to get into the temple. Um, this is the, what they believe is the beautiful gate. Many uh, the scholars don't all agree that it was this exact gate, but this is the gate on the eastern wall of the temple. Now, I wanted to show you this picture because here's Solomon's porch along this whole backside. And remember, this is where... Uh, Peter gives this sermon that's coming up, right? So they, they come into contact with the lame man at the beautiful gate. He leaps his way over to Solomon's porch, and that's where he will deliver the sermon, okay? I thought that was helpful for me. Maybe it's helpful for you. If not, disregard that. Okay, so as Peter and John enter the gate, they see this beggar, a man who has been lame from birth, okay? And here's lesson 101 in real estate. What is it? Location, 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 right? Why is he at this location? Well, several reasons. One of which is um, 
he would, the, his friends would bring him and sit him outside this gate every day because as people would come in, it was a Jewish law that you would need to give alms to the poor. So he's got his little cup there, and so they're coming in to pray three times a day, so he's getting money. This is a st- strategic thing, right? And if you're going to church, you're probably in a pretty benevolent mood, so you're wanting to give, right? And so this is a great idea for him. But also, y'all, this is so important, and this is, we'll tie this in in a minute, so hold this thought. Um, this man is sitting out there because his infirmity, Jewish law forbids him from going inside the gate, okay? So he cannot go. The Jewish law is prohibiting, is separating him from God, okay? So hold that thought. We're going to connect the dots here in a minute. So this lame man asks Peter and John for money. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. He fixed his attention on, him, on them, that is Peter and John, and he expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So the name of Jesus Christ is powerful because his name stands for all that he is. Just think about you, and if I were to call you by name, I would call you in, in knowing that all that you are, and your name represents who you are. And so the, the power of Jesus, is, the na- his name is so powerful because it re- represents everything he is. His authority, his majesty, his kingship, his deity. And Philippians 2 tells us that one day, at the mere mention of his name, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord God of all. And so what we need to see is that his name, the mere mention of his name has power. Not only to heal us physically as we see in this story, but more importantly to heal us spiritually. So y'all this man who Peter and, and John say rise up and walk, he immediately rises up and walks. Now, that is impressive, right? Because you can imagine, I watched this, a lot of you ladies brought in your little toddlers that are just toddling and learning to walk. Think how long it takes to learn how to walk, to build those muscles, to build those bones strong. And even when they're learning to walk, they walk for a few steps and then fall and then conk their head. So it's painful learning to walk, right? But not here. This was immediate. Think about that. This man who had never used these muscles, these bones, these ligaments, immediately, not only walking, leaping. Leaping and praising God. Just such a beautiful picture. But what I want us to see here is this miracle, it is a parallel between the lameness of the man and his healing and the spiritual lameness of humanity in our sin. So let's look at a few. We'll look at the first slide here, the similarities. The first one, the beggar was lame from birth, and you and I, and all of humanity, we are lame, we are broken, we are fallen um, from birth. We are born with sin in us. No one has to teach us how to sin, okay? So we are lame, spiritually lame from birth. Let's look at the second similarity. The beggar could do nothing to heal himself. He was satisfied with just sitting there and taking money from people. He couldn't, didn't even attempt to heal himself. You and I can do nothing to reconcile ourselves with God. We, we don't have, in our own flesh, we can do nothing. And the third similarity is that the beggar was healed by calling on the name of Jesus. And we know that the only way that you and I can be healed, whether it's spiritually, emotionally, or physically, is by calling on the name of Jesus Christ. So this story really is a metaphor for salvation, isn't it? But there are two more things that I want us to see. First, the beggar, he had immediate healing like we talked about. Immediately his bones, his ligaments were working well, perfectly. So too, salvation is immediate. You know, our faith doesn't teach us that you come... You get your act cleaned up, you get your life together, and then come, and then you can be saved. The gospel doesn't teach us you got to go through this checklist of stuff, and then you'll receive salvation. The gospel does not tell us 
that you need to learn as much as you can about Scripture, and then you come and you'll be received. No, how are we received? Just as we are. Come as you are, and he will receive you and repair and refresh and renew your broken body and your broken heart and your broken soul. Okay, the second thing that I want us to see is this story tells us that when God touches a life, it's not a temporary fix. It's a permanent cure. And that's what salvation is also. It is a permanent cure. When you and I call on the name of Jesus Christ, it is not something that will last a few weeks or a couple of years. It is permanent. There is nothing and no one that will ever be able to separate you from God's love. You are sealed with the Spirit at that point when you come in, in faith, um, claiming his name, you are sealed, and it is permanent, okay? So you can imagine that this is a story not just about a lame man being physically healed. It's a story of our salvation. And you can imagine that this, the people that were watching this were quite surprised, right? The people there in the temple, remember we talked, it's crowded, right? There's lots of people there. And um, there's people that had seen this man laying at this gate day after day, week after week, month after month. They probably stepped across him to get into the temple. And all of a sudden, this guy is leaping? Well, it's going to attract a crowd, right? And so they've made their way over to Solomon's porch. And Scripture tells us, did you read in there? The crowd ran to Peter to see what was going on, right? Right? But those that gathered around Peter, they assumed that it was Peter's power that healed this guy. Well, Peter's going to set the record straight, and this sets up his second sermon. He will let them know exactly who healed this man, and it was Jesus Christ. So, as he begins his speech, it's like Peter went to speech giving 101 because he hits the he hits it out of the park here the first rule of giving a speech is know your audience right for example if I was giving this same talk on Acts chapter 3 to a elementary school audience I would use different illustrations I would talk in a different manner I would make it so that it's on their level in their wheelhouse understandable for them right That's exactly what Peter does. He knows his audience. He knows his audience is a bunch of Jewish people. So he knows, okay, if I lead with Jesus, they're going to be lost. So let me lead with God because that's what we have in common. Verse 13, the beginning of the verse. He says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers... Now, every single Jewish person in the crowd at that point would have identified with these patriarchs. These were their fathers. These were their forefathers. And the God that they worshiped is the God that they are standing there in the temple today worshiping. Okay? And Peter's so smart. He ties it in. He says, hey, they're the, this is the God of our fathers. He's saying, I'm one of you. We're, we're in this together. Okay? He's our God. He doesn't stop there. He goes on. The end of that verse, he says, The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So Peter quickly moves. Now that he's got him, he's hooked him. Okay, that same God that you worship, that same God that you're here to pray to about today, that same God glorified Jesus. The same Jesus that you killed. Right? Peter's going to continue his sermon as he continues allowing the Holy Spirit to do some convicting in the crowd. And you saw here in this first verse of this sermon, he references Jesus as God's servant. But remember how we talked about... um, the name of Jesus Christ is so powerful, 
Why is it powerful? Because it stands for all that he is. He's going to go through the rest of his sermon and he's going to list many more names of Jesus. Let's look at some of them. Um, He refers to him here as his servant, the holy and righteous one, the author of life. He is Jesus. He is God's Christ or Messiah. He is Lord. He is a prophet. And why this is so brilliant on Peter's part is all of these names of Jesus were references to Old Testament names and scriptures when in the Old Testament it was prophesied, messianic prophecy leading to, pointing to the coming Messiah. And his crowd, the Jews, knew the Old Testament. So he's saying, you should have known this. You should have recognized this, but you missed it. And Peter's now going to make sure that everyone in the crowd understands that it wasn't Peter's power, it wasn't John's power, it was the power in the name of Jesus Christ that healed this man. Verse 13, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So what he's saying is it is Jesus who is the healer. It is Jesus who is the great physician. He and he alone has broken the the chains that have set this man free. And now he is free to dance and free to leap. And Peter is looking around the crowd and he says, and you too can have that same kind of freedom. All you have to do is call on, in faith, the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ. We'll read next week Peter's sermon, just like his first sermon was very effective, and thousands are, at this point in the sermon, wanting to come to Christ. And so he continues... Verse 19 and 20. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus. Now, we talked about before, and we'll continue talking about the concept of repentance. It is a turning, a 180-degree turning and going in a different direction. Um, In other words, I'm going, I'm fighting against Jesus, the Holy Spirit convicts me, I repent, and I turn, and now I am walking in obedience with Jesus. It's a total 180-degree turn from the direction you were going, right? And so Peter says, when you repent and turn, Jesus will blot out your sins. So what does that mean to blot out our sins? Um, You know, it's not just a matter of Jesus is going to look the other way. Or he's going to say, you know what, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that you did that in 1982, but I really know you did. That is not the the picture here. The actual wording, the, the original language for blot out sin, it's a legal term. Okay, it has legal ramifications. So let's just walk through this. For you and I, before we came into salvation, before we had that initial moment of repentance coming to salvation, we were all guilty of sin, right? Separated from God, right? Um, Peter says very clearly in the scriptures this week, those who do not call on the name of the Lord will be eternally separated from God, which means you will spend an eternity in hell. He makes it very, very clear. But what if I don't want to be eternally separated? How do I get right with God? Is it it how much money I give? Is it how good of a person I am? How benevolent I am? How many times I come to church? Is that what gets me right with God? Is that what pays the debt and squares the debt? No, absolutely not. Scripture tells us we in our flesh cannot square the debt of sin. And so who can? 
very good. Jesus is the only one that can do that. And he went to the cross and his, he shed his blood in order to satisfy the debt that you and I owe. So legally, we are made square, we are made whole, we are made right with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And script, this scripture, all scripture tells us, when we call on his name, we will be saved. And all of our sin, past, present, future, will be blotted out. Meaning, not that he says, I know you did it, but, you know, I'm going to let you slide. Absolutely, it means it's gone as if it never existed. He will never bring it up against you. It cannot be held against you. What beauty there. And then he says, and you will be refreshed and restored, and you will be set free. Free to live the life that God has planned for us. So what's in a name? Well, everything, if that name is Jesus, right? Right? Have you called on the power of the name of Jesus? Have you experienced the freedom that he offers? He wants to heal you and make you whole. Will you today call on the powerful name of Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you that you provide a way for us. All we have to do is call on your perfect, majestic name. Father, don't let anyone leave here today without making sure they have done that. It is in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.